This is KGW News at Sunrise. Good morning and thank you for getting up with us on this Saturday morning. I'm Galen Etlin. This morning on Sunrise, we are keeping you updated as Oregon's COVID restrictions change again. We'll explain what will reopen and what has to stay closed. Plus, a different kind of Black Friday. How the unofficial shopping holiday panned out in the middle of a pandemic. But first, let's check in with our Chris McGinnis live at home for a quick check of your forecast. Damp out there, Chris. Yeah, a little damp this morning, but you know what? I think the rain that we see today is going to be primarily this morning over the next couple of hours. Gail, and let's take it live right now to radar or actually over the last three hours. You can see the progress that very weak frontal system has made through the region. We've got some light still falling in the Cascades above about 3,500 feet and light showers passing through, uh, well, the Portland, Vancouver metro area right now. And they will continue pressing south and eastward over the next couple of hours. Meanwhile, uh, we do have some patchy fog out there. It's not bad in the metro area. You get down towards Aurora, though, reporting a half mile visibility. And the southern Willamette Valley is still pretty socked in, although that fog should continue to lift here over the next couple of hours. So not not as uh, long in duration as yesterday. The live look from our Wells Fargo Sky Camera. Obviously, uh, the clouds hanging over downtown. Some light rain falling at PDX right now. It's 39 right now in Portland and elsewhere. 38 Hillsboro, 37 Sherwood. Big picture statewide. The cool stuff in the eastern part of the state. How about <laughs> cool? 15 right now in Burns, 26 in Baker City. All right, the plan for today, Saturday, early showers, but I think those dissipate pretty quickly. So we're probably going to start to really dry things out, at least in the I-5 corridor by mid to late morning. And we should see a few sun breaks today with highs in the upper 40s. We'll have a look ahead to your Sunday and uh, the end of November and the beginning of December. How about that? <laughs> Coming up in just a few minutes. Already there. Chris, thank you so much. We begin the six o'clock half hour with the COVID-19 pandemic as Oregon prepares for a new set of restrictions next week. So let's start with the latest numbers here. The Oregon Health Authority reported 826 new cases yesterday and three new deaths. Now officials tell us that case number is artificially low since some agencies were off for the holiday on Thursday. For example, Multnomah County only reported 14 cases compared to the rest of the week when it reported several hundred each day. OHA expects an unusually high case count today as those missing cases get reported. So here's a look now at the daily case curve that we've shown you for months. Until yesterday, the state reported more than a thousand cases each day for more than a week. Some staff and people staying at the Union Gospel Mission in Old Town have tested positive for COVID-19. The organization offers services to people facing homelessness in Portland. And this comes after a huge effort to hand out Thanksgiving meals to go. Now, the organization says that people who tested positive were not in the dining room. Residents and staff will be quarantined and tested. So now the mission is temporarily changing meal services in downtown Portland, but it didn't specify how. Leaders are also temporarily closing the mission's thrift shop in Tigard. But some good news here. Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine could be available in Oregon and Washington in just a few weeks. Oregon's governor says around 30,000 health care workers treating COVID-19 patients could get the first dose of the vaccine in late December. Washington expects more than 62,000 initial doses. Officials there say those will be distributed, distributed rather to the most vulnerable populations and to first responders. Emergency federal approval of Pfizer's vaccine is expected on December 10th. Moderna, another company, is also seeking approval for its vaccine. Looking ahead now, once the statewide freeze in Oregon ends on Wednesday, people will have a new set of guidelines to follow the next day. Some businesses will be allowed to reopen, but others will stay closed. KGW's Devin Haskins explains. At Werner Beef and Brew in Tillamook County, the tables have been set off to the side for the better part of a week. But as far as business goes, it was a pretty big decrease in total business. Indoor dining has been banned in all of Oregon, a one size fits all approach to slow the spread. That was kind of the hard thing, minding our P's and Q's, knowing that our county wasn't necessarily a, a high risk area, but we still wanted to make sure that we were following all the guidelines. Under the new guidelines, in the 21 counties that are in the extreme risk category, or those in red, can only have outdoor dining of up to 50 people. Tillamook County, as of now, is in green, and those in green can now seat up to 50% indoors, welcoming diners back inside. We're really excited. We, we've been biting our teeth and, and biting our tongue ready for this to open up and, and get people sitting back down and enjoying beers. Among the new changes, retail and grocery stores in the high and extreme risk counties 
will need to reduce their capacity down from 75 to 50 percent. Fitness centers can reopen with limitations unless they're in an extreme risk county, which means staying closed altogether. And churches and other faith-based organizations can increase their indoor and outdoor capacity. We closed the doors to in-person worship in March and in-person indoor worship in March. And a lot of our churches have really adapted really well to doing online worship. The United Methodist Church is more than 100 churches throughout Oregon. They've created their own guidelines, which have been as strict, if not stricter, than the state's. And despite the 100-person max in an extreme risk county, no matter the county, UMC is limiting churches to just 10, and in some cases, 25. We want to hold our hold ourselves accountable, and we don't want to become church sites that become super spreaders of the virus. Coming up on Monday, the Oregon Health Authority will finalize that color-coded map based off of county data. The new guidelines don't take effect until December 3rd. I'm Devin Haskins, KGW News. The time is 6.06 .06 here, and a gym in Salem has to pay a fine for defying the closure orders. The owners of Courthouse Club Fitness said they plan to keep their five locations open through the freeze, posting on Facebook they would not survive another closure. Now, after initial warnings, the state fined the owners $90,000, and that includes fines for multiple gym locations. The gyms could also face daily fines again if they don't shut down. All right, now to a question we've gotten from many of you. Did anyone actually call police on their neighbors this holiday? First, some context. Oregon's COVID freeze, in effect right now, places a six-person limit on gatherings. Possible penalties included a jail and a fine. Now, last week, Governor Kate Brown told us she believed people should call police if they thought neighbors were breaking the rules. So we checked with local dispatchers to see how many calls they actually got on Thanksgiving. And they're still piecing the info together, but here's what we know so far. Portland's emergency dispatch tells us it got 10 calls about the governor's order on Thanksgiving Day. The Washington County Sheriff's Office got two non-emergency calls. Lake Oswego Police got one. And in Marion County, no deputies were sent to any reported violations. At this point, we're waiting to hear about any possible arrests or fines actually issued. We'll keep you posted once we find out. We are now hearing from an Oregon family that stopped a man from stealing their car. He broke into their home and even ate some of their holiday food while he was at it. Now, this is some of the mess they say Antonio Bernal left behind in Cedar Mill on Thanksgiving morning. Those are marshmallows that you see scattered all over the floor of that van. The homeowner heard the car alarm go off in, early in the morning and went down to confront Bernal, who had his pockets full of tools from the garage. The homeowner, Dana Huntington, says Bernal stuck around and actually told him a friend had given him the keys to the van. He held out the keys and I recognized that the key chain was an Oregon duck key chain that was my wife's, that was in my house, in my kitchen. So now I know that he'd been not only in my car, but in my garage and my kitchen while all of us were asleep had a few choice words for the guy. Obviously, Dana realized that story wasn't true from Bernal as well. Dana kept Bernal occupied until Washington County deputies got there and no one got hurt. Deputies say Bernal used the bathroom in the house and ate food prepared for Thanksgiving too. He faces several charges for breaking in. We do have an update now on Portland's promise to clear homeless camps from Laurelhurst Park. And that process started last week. Take a look here though, dozens of tents are still there. One man camping there says some people moved out voluntarily, but the city has not forced everyone to leave. He heard crews are coming back Monday, though. Neighbors have begged officials to clear the camp for weeks. Last week, a rep for the Laurelhurst Neighborhood Association said some neighbors have been threatened and harassed by people living in the camp. But advocates argue sweeps are cruel, especially as temperatures drop. Mayor Ted Wheeler calls the camps inhumane and plans to carry out more sweeps. He reached out uh, we reached out rather to his office about this one at Laurelhurst Park and a rep emailed us saying the sweep is still ongoing. He said clearing camps of this size normally takes about a week. Let's turn now to sports. There was nobody in the stands, but the Ducks and Beavers sure gave everybody a rivalry game to remember in Corvallis. It was a foggy night for the 124th matchup between the two teams. Now this game came down to the final minute. The Ducks up by four when Chance Nolan pushed it into the end zone on the quarterback sneak. Now the Beavers upset the Ducks 41 to 38, really close there. It's Oregon State's first win in the series since 2016. 
It also dashes Oregon's hopes for the college football playoff. KGW's Orlando Sanchez will have more, much more about this game coming up for us later this morning. And still to come, the economy feels the COVID impact with a very different kind of Black Friday. How the unofficial shopping holiday looked in the middle of a pandemic and the effects.